Uh, my name is Greg Paquette. I am the Director of Graduate Studies here at the Providence Campus for the Medical Laboratory Sciences Program. And it's my honor to act as the MC this evening. I think you're in for a rather fun ride uh, this evening. Uh, the, 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 the game plan for the evening is, uh, I've got a few folks I want to introduce who want to say a few words and welcomes, then I'll introduce our, our presenters. Um, and each of them will do the presentation, and we'd ask that folks, that if you have a burning question, go ahead and ask it, but uh, we kind of want to do a Q&A at the very end, so uh, we appreciate that. And if you do have a question, uh, we have Joe down here has the microphone, and we ask you to ask the question into the microphone, if Joe will let go of it for a minute. <laughs> um, just so, because this is all going to be uh, videotaped, and we'll be putting it on. YouTube and cable and URI live and that sort of thing. So, uh, the first person I would like to, uh, oh, first of all, our presenters this evening, which I briefly introduce now, are Dr. Michael Fine from the Rhine Department of Health, uh, Elaine Parker Williams, a, a uh, I didn't think that was for me. Uh, Elaine Parker Williams, who is a doctoral nursing student at URI, who's been very active in the Liberian community here in Rhode Island. And our third presenter, who is actually coming from another conference right now, Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott, who will be here shortly. She's coming from Brown, I believe. There's something going on over there. But first, the first person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Shashi Maida, who is a professor of medical laboratory science and is the coordinator of our graduate public health lab science course. Uh, in his previous life, he was a director at the labs at the Rhode Island Department of Health. And uh, we think that it helped us getting uh, a, a very significant speaker like Dr. Fine. It never hurt. So, Dr. Mayda. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I want to give you a little history of this class. Uh, I was at the Department of Health at that time, and we always talked about immunization and, and perfect rate for that. And as, as I evolved from Brown University as a faculty, uh, we began to talk about creating a course called Environment, Public Health, and Immunity. And, and then I taught that at Brown in summer program for quite a while. Uh, but that was at a lower level, and then we decided to bring it here uh, at the university, at the graduate level. Uh, the course, the way we designed, is to make you I have feeling for practical part as what goes on in the real world. And as I always say in my class, we all have public health policy, uh, sometimes at state level, sometimes at the federal level, uh, and so on. But what we need here is healthy public policy, and, and that we, need, we can only get when our leaders are here uh, to see what's really going on. Uh, so having said that, this course is in its third offering, and our students are sitting right here, and they, ha they are actually expected to write a grant on something, and quite many of them have picked Ebola as a topic. And so it was a burning thing for us, and we decided that we will do a topic on that. And last week, we had a lecture uh, from Deputy Director of Department of Health on some of the legal aspects of Ebola. So you can see where we are headed, when we started, we had no clue to what the, how Ebola will evolve, and now you can see where we are. So it is really my pleasure, and Dr. Fine's office has been excellent uh, in their response, and it's really nice of you to come here and give us a talk, and so is Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott. So I'm sure we'll learn a lot today, and also some of you may have privilege to hear congressional hearings today. I did. Being an academic, I guess I can get that kind of time during daytime uh, to do that. And, and it's really eye-opener for many of us. So have fun today to try to learn something, even though it's a set subject that we need to get handled on. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Dr. Maida. Uh, the next person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Lori Chikamaskola. I hope I didn't mess your name up too bad, Lauren. Lori is our new dean here at the, at the Feinstein Province campus, but also gets to continue to be the interim dean at the College of Human Science and Services. So we're lucky to be able to grab her. Thank you. I just want to say on, on behalf of the dean's office, uh, the Alan Schott Feinstein College of Continuing Education, welcome 
to the URI Fireside campus. And I want to thank Dr. Paquette and Dr. Maya for having the vision to open up the graduate uh, seminar series uh, to, to the community. Because as we have talked about all day today, there, if you look at the, the media, um, there's a lot of things out there, there's a lot of interesting information. And so it's wonderful to have uh, this panel of, of, of health experts who will obviously give us the right information. Uh, and, and again, thank you for being here. So thank you for taking the time to be here. It's a very important event, a very timely, important topic. Uh, as Dr. Paquette said, uh, I think we're going to learn a lot more uh, than we've known before. So thanks very much. Thank you, Lord. I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Vanessa Quaidu, who is the director of the URI African Studies Program. And we very much appreciate uh, her and Dr. McCray getting involved with this program, and the two of them have been very active with the Rhode Island uh, West African uh, community. Dr. McCray. Good evening. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening, uh, especially to our guest panelists, Dr. Fine. And soon coming Dr. Scott, and the soon to be Dr. Parker Williams, Dr. Elaine uh, Parker Williams, soon to be. And it's a special joy to share the stage with her because we go back uh, many years and it just was really great to see her and her family tonight. But as was stated, my name is Vanessa Quainu. I'm Dr. Quainu, and I'm the director of the Africana Studies Program we are based in Kingston, but we are not bound to Kingston. Uh, we have a real heart for Providence, as you can imagine, and we are eager to lead the way in topics that have to do with West Africa. Uh, along with my distinguished colleague, Dr. John McCray, many initiatives are being developed now to address the more long-standing problems in West Africa, particularly economic development, education, and training, and the transmission of technology. The solution to the Ebola crisis is critically linked and closely connected to economic development. So having said that, I want to thank you for being here, all of you, and to welcome you, to thank you, Dr. Paquette, and your team for uh, taking the lead here, and it is, it, is, it is Africana Studies that is very, very concerned that the University of Rhode Island take the lead and be a voice for change and, and an advocate for development in West Africa. So, yes, I believe we're in for a great evening, and thank you for being here. Uh, and our last welcomer is Dr. John McCray, who uh, I've worked with John for way too many years. And uh, I would like to say Dr. McCray looks much happier now that he's returned to the world of scholarship and teaching and has left the uh, world of upper administration. But I would like to say that Dr. McCray, the former vice provost of the Promise Campus, played a very, very significant role in, this, in the development and success of, of all the programs we're involved with here at the Providence Campus. Dr. McCray. Thank you, Greg. And welcome. I'd like to congratulate the dean of the uh, campus. I think he's going to do a marvelous job for you as well. And I'm always glad to come back to uh, the Providence Campus of the University of Rhode Island. that you have today is very important. But we understand that we're very thankful to Greg Parkett and his people for allowing us to co-sponsor it, understanding that they will be looking a great deal at the medical and biological impacts of this dreadful disease. But we want to also remind you that the greatest impact uh, of this disease will be upon the economy and well-being of the people in these areas. Health is not a personal issue. It is a personal right 
It is a human right. And people in uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, the Guinea, Nigeria, they have a right as human beings to be protected against this level four pathogen, which as you see, now that it has come to the United States, because as the, 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 the philosopher from the ghetto once said, what goes around shall come around. And so now you have not taken care of these people very well in this disease. It's now in the United States. It is amazing uh, how efficient uh, people from some of the poorest countries in the world have been in protecting themselves and fighting this disease. And it's amazing to me as I look upon what is going on in this country with all this wealth and greatness being able to take, uh, take control of this virus. Eventually, I'm sure we will. Uh, this uh, meeting is very important because what's important, as Dr. Quino has said, we need education, we need training, and we need a spread of technology. And don't forget, we also need to send them money. As I always told my people when they work for me, that many of you think that money is tainted, but I tell you, it tainted enough. <laughs> and in fact, if we don't get, at least to them, in the next fiscal year, at least $400 million, then I am afraid to tell you, that this disease may in fact get out of order. Thank you for having us be very interesting. Uh, Dr. Vine and uh, uh, Mr. Parker Williams, I'm sure will give an excellent presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Uh, just a few other people I'd like to acknowledge this evening who were very helpful in putting this together. Uh, Dr. Kat Quinn, who is the Associate Dean of the Providence Campus. person makes everything work around here, so we're very much, and she hosted the reception ahead of time, which I know some of you were able to enjoy. I'd also like to recognize, I think she's still here, Princess Matouche. Is Princess still here? Wait a minute. Princess Matouche is in the office of the She and uh, Dr. Quinn are very active in trying to connect uh, the, with the Kingston campus and providing support uh, for the uh, West African student community here uh, in, in the province. Uh, the other person I'd like to thank, I think he's still outside getting food, is Mr. John O'Leary, who's the director of special programs, who uh, uh, was very uh, helpful in assisting in getting this up. So, so. Okay, now that the welcomes have gone so long, I think we have to call it in the next. <laughs> Our first presenter this evening is Dr. Michael Fine, who is the director of the Department of Health. And, uh, if I, if I was going to read his bio, it would probably take me about 20 minutes, and he's a very humble person, and he's probably been introduced about a thousand times in the last couple of weeks. So, uh, without further ado, Dr. Michael Fine. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Um, very nice to be here. Um, it's a great honor to be here with so many friends and colleagues. Uh, I would like to tell you that this is going to be fun, as was mentioned before, but I'm afraid it's not going to be much fun. Um, but it is important information uh, for Rhode Islanders to know and know about. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of my uh, co-workers and colleagues. Uh, on an ovation, Dr. Elise Klein in the back. Um, I think Joe uh, Crew is going to join us. I don't know if he's here yet, um, but he helps me more than anybody. Um, and she got away, but uh, she's not a employee of the Department of Health, but Kromasa Amos, I mean, his daughter, has been an amazing uh, teacher at Spark Club um, and has helped us understand things about uh, this epidemic in the Liberian community that we would not have known otherwise. Um, the watchwords that I use for, Liber for uh, Ebola in the United States and in Rhode Island are calm, thoughtful, and vigilant. Um, I don't think the risks to Rhode Island are overwhelming. There are some. Um, but I think Ebola is a disease we can contain in Rhode Island. I don't think that's true for West Africa. And I would agree with Dr. McRae and others, that if we do not put together a very robust response and do it tomorrow, um, we're going to see a human tragedy uh, 
um, unlike anything any of us have seen in our adult lives. Um, so, uh, by way of overview, um, the uh, 2014 West African Ebola outbreak is the worst Ebola outbreak in history. The case fatality rate is between 50 and 70 percent at least. Um, and that means that if you uh, should get Ebola, your chance of dying is at least 50 to 70 percent. Um, only 50 to 30 percent of people who get Ebola will survive. And the number, particularly in rural areas, may be smaller. Um, the good news, if you're in the United States, is that only people who have been in West Africa in the prior 21 days are at risk, um, and that people are not contagious unless they show symptoms. Now, one of the things that I want to emphasize is I'm talking about our current state of knowledge and about the current behavior of the virus. Viruses evolve, and it's important to have some understanding about disease ecology that what we see today may not be what we see in a month. Um, our uh, knowledge about what to do and how to do it is evolving and is likely to change. Our recommendations are likely to change. We work daily with CDC. There's Joe Pru. Let's give him a round of applause. He's an amazing, amazing guy. Um, so uh, just uh, understand that what you hear from me today may change over time. Um, there is no vaccine and there is no treatment at the moment besides supportive care. Um, we hope there will be a vaccine, but it is unlikely to be available and scalable in the next four to six months, which is when uh, the challenge to West Africa will be greatest. Um, the outbreak can be stopped by good public health process. Uh, good public health practice. That is to say, if you can find every single person who's infected and get them into isolation, we will stop the epidemic in three weeks. Um, what we haven't done is put together the resources we need to get that done. Um, the United States has done a wonderful thing uh, by putting together the military effort to build 17 of all the treatment units in Liberia alone and I think 23 treatment units and the rest all together in Africa. Um, but we still need many, many healthcare workers and community volunteers, volunteer healthcare workers from around the world to come and help. I was in Liberia in 2009. Um, when I was there, there were 50 physicians for a country of four and a half million people. Um, that number hasn't increased very much and one of the real difficulties and challenges is that, for a number of reasons which I'll discuss a little later, uh, Ebola preferentially affects healthcare workers. So that uh, so far, 400 healthcare workers have been infected in West Africa, and over 200 have died. That has really reduced the number of healthcare workers available um, to take care of people in West Africa. In 2009, there were 1,300 nurses. And to lose 150 nurses in the middle of this epidemic is a tragedy beyond description. Um, while we may see a few imported cases in Rhode Island, good public health collaboration will very likely prevent any spread. We've got great collaboration. Many people working uh, all day long and sometimes around the clock to make sure that our healthcare institutions are prepared and ready. We've been working on this at the Department of Health since July. We've been tracking this epidemic since March. Um, and I think we are as prepared as any state and more prepared than most in terms of what healthcare workers know and what healthcare workers understand and the information we've been putting out. Um, now, the virus itself is a phylovirus, and that's important because it's a virus, a type of virus we haven't seen in the United States, and has been seen only rarely in Africa. That's important because we don't have immunity to phyloviruses, and we don't have immunity, thus we don't have immunity to viruses that are like Ebola, 
And so there's no opportunity for what's called cross-reacting immunity. Sometimes if you're immune to a virus that's like the virus going around, you get some protection. We don't have some protection against the phylum virus. Ebola virus disease is a severe, often fatal disease in humans and animals, mostly in bats and monkeys and gorillas and chimpanzees and some kinds of antelope in Africa. Um, bats appear to be the reservoir. Uh, and what usually happens is following an initial human infection through contact with an infected bat or other animal, human to human transmission often occurs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later when, when I talk about the previous outbreaks that we've seen uh, in Africa. Um, symptoms usually appear 2 to 21 days after exposure. Those symptoms include fever, severe headache, muscle pain, weakness, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, lack of appetite, and unexplained, unexplained bleeding or bruising, particularly severe bleeding or bruising, often bleeding through the gastrointestinal tract. Um, the good news is, if you think you've been exposed, but you aren't sick 21 days after exposure, you will not become sick as cold. The virus is spread through bodily fluids. Um, a person becomes infected by handling or touching um, a person who is sick with Ebola, by handling or touching objects contaminated with bodily fluids, or by touching or handling the body of a deceased Ebola victim. <coughs> now what's interesting and a little unusual about Ebola um, is that uh, one, before someone has had symptoms, they are not infectious. But after they develop symptoms, they are exceptionally infectious as the viral load associated with Ebola is larger than any viral load I think we see in any other virus. So that if you uh, touch or handle uh, a person who's sick or uh, their bodily fluids or the body of a deceased Ebola victim and touch your eyes or mouth, the virus is introduced into your body and you can become sick. It's that hand-to-mouth contact that we believe, in the current state of our knowledge, is associated with most transmission. Um, you can obviously get sick through an open cut, a wound, or abrasion, and you can actually get sick through sexual contact. Um, the Ebola virus lives in wet body fluids outside the body for several days. That's particularly important now because in West Africa it's rainy season. So it's a perfect situation for the virus to hang around. The virus lives on a dry surface for several hours. Um, the virus, however, lives in the body of a deceased person who died from Ebola for weeks. And it lives in the semen of people who have recovered for two to three months. How does Ebola get to human people? Um, a hunter or cook handles, cleans, or eats bush meat from an infected animal from West Africa. That's the usual scenario. And the bush meat probably gets infected when the fruit bats left some of their bodily fluids on the fruit and uh, the other animals handle or eat uh, the, uh, the, the fruit. Um, then a family member or caregiver uh, cleans up after a sick Ebola patient um, and removes their soiled sheets to do laundry or touches them and doesn't wear personal protective equipment um, because they're family members. Um, and then those people become ill. Or at a funeral, um, mourners touch a loved one who died of Ebola, wipe away tears, cover their mouths, rub their eyes, um, and introduce the virus into their own bodies. This virus is so infectious that a single viral particle is enough to get people infected. It is an exceptionally infectious virus with a huge viral load or another transmission scenario, and this has been very painful. A health care worker treats an Ebola patient 
either without wearing personal protective equipment or improperly uses the personal protective equipment um, or removes the personal protective equipment in the wrong order. Um, for those of us who have been in an operating room, the process, the order of putting on uh, personal protective equipment is pretty precise. Um, and those of us who have had the opportunities to go through medical school have learned to do that. But the process around Ebola is 10 times more precise. There is no room for error at all. One tiny slip, one infinitesimal slip, one tiny nick in the personal protective equipment, and a, uh, a healthcare worker can become ill. That's why we are paying such close attention to healthcare workers, um, because healthcare workers themselves uh, are at such great risk. Because I mean, think about it. If you are not, if you're going to get a ball, but you're not sick and you're staying at home, um, you're not going to be infecting other people. The moment you get sick, what do you do? You go to get healthcare, and so you're cared for. All the time that you're cared for by healthcare workers is when you are most infectious, and most infectious is usually infectious, which is what's the problem. Now, how is Ebola treated? Unfortunately, there's no vaccine. And unfortunately, there's no vaccine yet. Hopefully there will be one. Um, but I'm not sure the vaccine that we'll see, though it may be in time for the United States and Europe, will be in time for West Africa. Um, there's no proven treatment yet. Care is only supported. That means we give lots of fluids, we uh, give blood, we make sure somebody has oxygen, um, and we take care of them through the very difficult time um, when they are most infectious. The body takes about 10 days to mount an immune response. And uh, if a person is strong enough to last through the 10 days of this huge infection, in it and, and can last until their immune system is able to make antibody against the virus, and then they have a shot at surviving. But it's that first, you know, 10 days or so. We don't know exactly about Ebola. This is logic from what usually happens with bacterial infections. Um, but, you know, until the body is able to make its own uh, antibodies, um, the person is usually very sick. Um, and Ebola, the, the thing to remember though is Ebola can be stopped by what we call classic public health management, that is making sure that we find everybody who is sick by tracing the contacts of everyone we know is sick, identifying those contacts, um, and then watching those people closely um, and getting them into isolation at the moment they become sick. Ebola is not spread through the air, um, through water, um, through drinking water, through, through eating food, and even bushmeat, we believe the risks to bushmeat aren't the consumption of the meat, um, because if the meat is cooked, it usually destroys the virus. The risk is from handling the bushmeat and then having the people who handle it touch their own mouth or eyes. Um, Ebola is not spread by mosquitoes, and Ebola is not spread by people without Ebola symptoms. And that last part is particularly important as you listen to people's concerns, um, because many people are actually concerned about being exposed to people without symptoms, but they are not people who can transmit disease. So how do we stop an outbreak? We find and diagnose everyone who's sick. We isolate everyone who's sick and take care of them in isolation and protect healthcare workers from getting sick as they care for those people. Um, and then we work hard to prevent uh, healthcare workers from getting sick by the process of infection control. And again, for Ebola, the process of infection control is as precise as any infection control that exists in any other part of healthcare. Um, this is just saying over and over again the same thing. That we have to identify people and, and get those 
uh, and exposed into isolation for people who have been in contact with a sick Ebola patient um, but are not sick, we, we monitor them uh, by checking their temperature twice a day and watching for symptoms for the first 21 days. Um, there's often a process of self-monitoring means you saw that happening in Texas, um, and you see it happening now. Um, and, you know, kudos to the two healthcare workers who went through that process and identified their illness right away and brought themselves to the hospital and get them, got themselves into treatment. Because what they were doing when they did that was heroically protecting others. The people involved in this process, the healthcare workers who are taking care of folks with Ebola in West Africa and, and here, are you know, the world's greatest living heroes right at the moment because they are protecting everyone else. Um, and they are standing up to their own fear um, and putting their love of community in front of their love of self. And that's something that I think we all need to be thankful for. Um, and should one of those health workers become sick, then we start the cycle again with their uh, new contacts. Now you may wonder why we have uh, contact with all the people who are on the uh, flight from Dallas to Cleveland that the second healthcare worker was on. And I think that would be called uh, an abundance of caution. Um, there is no actual reason for being concerned about becoming ill from someone before they're sick. Um, but we're double and triple checking because we do not want this disease to spread the United States. The greatest risk to spread is somebody who becomes ill didn't know they were exposed, um, didn't know what, the, you know, the, the symptoms of, of Ebola are not specific. They're not much different from having the flu or having a cold um, or, uh, or having a bad virus. Only well, this one's a real bad virus. Um, so the real risk is somebody becomes sick and stays home um, and has uh, vomiting or diarrhea and their families at home or others have contact with those bodily fluids. And then, you know, if, if 20 people become sick, as is what happened in Nigeria, um, and those 20 people infect 20 more people, um, a very dangerous cycle begins. And that's really what we're seeing all across West Africa today. The history of Ebola outbreaks, um, we the first recorded outbreak was in Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, in 1976. Over the last uh, now uh, close to 40 years, we've seen 318 cases with a case fatality rate of 88%. 88% of people in previous outbreaks who got Ebola died. And typically what happened was that Ebola would break out in an isolated rural community um, and basically kill everyone in that community. Um, the entire community would be wiped out and so there was no one to take the virus elsewhere. So most of these outbreaks were between 10 and 100 people with over, over 10 outbreaks, a grand total of 318 uh, cases. Um, and, you know, what, what the biggest risk is to see Ebola spread um, by personal contact and the use of contaminated needles and syringes in hospitals and clinics. Um, and you know, that's the old history. Um, in West Africa in 2014, the first case was a two-year-old in Guinea, um, but in a part of Guinea that is very close to the border with uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone. Um, and you know, borders in West Africa are not necessarily uh, so intense that people don't go back and forth a little bit. Um, and what happened was people spread first to close family members, then to healthcare workers, and then the healthcare workers unfortunately spread it to others. This outbreak is the largest and deadliest outbreak in history. 
and the first in West Africa, though there has been a related case, not of this strain of virus, in Ivory Coast. In this outbreak, six countries have been affected um, uh, with the significant and severe cases, number of cases in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Um, Nigeria has had 20 cases altogether, but no new cases since the 20th of uh, since the 5th of September, so at the moment, the outbreak in Nigeria is considered contained. One case in Spain, um, and this slide unfortunately needs updating, now we have three cases in Dallas, Texas, and one fatality. Um, as of, of October 8th, there were uh, close to 4,000 deaths, we're over 4,000 now, I believe. Um, as of October 8th, we had about 8,000 cases. Um, and the CDC estimates that we underreport by a factor of 2.5 because of the lack of uh, good communication to rural areas. Um, the, you have to multiply these numbers by 2.5 because we believe many cases are never recognized or reported, which means right about now, um, we are likely to have 30,000 cases and about 15,000 deaths when you adjust for the passage of time. Um, and that's just the one. Without large-scale interventions, CDC models project Ebola will double approximately every 15 to 20 days. Um, and in, in Liberia, and every 30 to 40 days in Sierra Leone, though I think the numbers coming out of Sierra Leone are now approaching the numbers in Liberia. Um, because a lot of what we think we know turns out to be affected by uh, the absence of easy communication. Um, and so the situation in those countries is very dire indeed. If you look at the World Health Organization projections, which I do, um, you see that in the last three or four weeks, the numbers in Liberia, the weekly reporting of new cases has been dropping. Some people have taken reassurance from that, but WHO in its wisdom, uh, correctly, I think um, history will tell us, but likely uh, correctly observed that that's because of the social collapse in rural places in the absence of reporting. So what you have to really do is mentally keep walking those numbers up um, so that uh, the current estimate is by uh, the 1st of December, we should be seeing 10,000 new cases a week. Um, and by January 20th, the estimate is we will have 550,000 Ebola cases. Um, that we can count, and actually 1.4 million cases when corrected for underreporting. Um, half of those will be deaths, so that means we're looking in our lifetimes at losing three quarters of a million people by January. And if you walk the numbers with me, um, that means by February those numbers will double. Um, CDC models suggest that the epidemic will end when 70% of affected people are in medical care facilities um, or Ebola treatment units. Um, we are rushing to build 1,700 uh, Ebola treatment unit beds. There are, I think, five or 600 now. Um, and that's a good thing. Um, but if we have 4,000 cases in Liberia, and 2,000 people who have been infected figure that half of those are infected now. That means we need 1,000 beds today and we probably have 500. Um, and by the time six or eight weeks pass and we get our 1,700 beds, we're likely to need in the range of five to 10,000 beds if we're gonna get this epidemic stuff. Um, and the challenge for all of us is to figure out a way to get the resources we need to West Africa to get it, this epidemic stopped and to get these resources to West Africa tomorrow. This is not something that will wait 
This is not something that gets better by being ignored. All that happens if you ignore it is it doubles. Now in the United States, um, this is a older slide. Um, there have been uh, now uh, eight Ebola cases, uh, Ebola cases treated in U.S. hospitals. Four were U.S. healthcare workers um, or other people. And I think the number is probably a little smaller. I'm not sure they've released the names of everyone. And the number's a little larger, so they're probably, you know, my guess is uh, eight to ten total cases that have been brought back to the United States. And we are bringing cases to four hospitals. Um, Emory, the National Institute of Health, uh, a hospital in Montana, and a hospital in Nebraska. Um, you know, as everybody knows, one case involved a Liberian man um, who was admitted to the hospital in Dallas um, after getting symptoms four days after arriving in Dallas, who died uh, on October 8th. And there's one patient who was originally from Rhode Island, um, went to Moses Brown, um, became ill in Liberia, was treated there, and then flown to Nebraska Hospital. And I think he's reasonably stable. Thank goodness. Um, so here are the scenarios that it's worth everyone thinking about as we all think together about how to be prepared. They all involve a person who's traveled from West Africa in the last 21 days and has symptoms of Ebola. Um, in the first scenario, a person enters the emergency, hospital emergency department. Hospital emergency departments are particularly well prepared to ask the question of, have you traveled in the last 21 days if people have fever? And we believe are really able to get people quickly into isolation. Um, and, and the process in hospitals, when someone comes in having traveled in the last 21 days and having a fever, is that the person will be immediately isolated. We will do a blood test um, and uh, wait for the results before the isolation is removed. We've had a, a number of those in Rhode Island so far. I don't know the exact number, um, but they've all been handled well. And every single one of them have been, has been uh, proven not to have the bone. A little bit of context. It's hard to, to imagine the numbers currently uh, about Ebola in Africa. It's also important to remember that there are a million deaths from malaria every year in Africa. Um, and, you know, so the likelihood today of somebody coming to the United States and having a fever is they're more likely to have malaria than they are to have Ebola. Um, but that will change as the numbers in Africa changes. However, I think it's worth us all reflecting back and taking the energy that we're putting into thinking about Ebola in Africa and thinking about malaria and infant diarrhea and other infectious diseases that have been killing millions of people in Africa. Um, and we, they, they are all diseases and conditions that we have not effectively together addressed. So one scenario is somebody comes into the emergency department, I think we're in pretty good shape for that. Another scenario is a sick person goes to a primary care doctor's office. Um, Dr. Klein is working with us to help the primary care community be well prepared. We've done some conference calls, we put stuff up on our website. Um, you know, and in that scenario, basically what happens is the patient is isolated, EMS is called, and the patient is transported after good communication. To the hospital. Those are scenarios that Dr. Klein designed um, and probably got them designed before anybody else in the country. Um, I think they've been used by our colleagues in other states and by CDC itself. Another scenario is that a sick person enters a nursing home as a healthcare worker. There are many Rhode Island healthcare workers who are from West Africa. And we have to all be thinking through how to help those people when they return from travel and make sure that they and the people they take care of are safe. And the other scenario is uh, that somebody comes from West Africa and gets sick and exposes others who themselves get sick and have contacts with others. That's what the Liberian community has been working with us on and has been phenomenal at educating us and the community as a whole um, so that I think people are prepared and know what to do if somebody should get sick. 
Um, this is a picture of the Ebola Begone Rally, um, which was late August, if my memory is right, um, and which really helped call attention to Ebola in Rhode Island and across the United States. Um, there are about 15,000 Rhode Islanders of Liberian descent, um, and we've had the honor of working pretty closely with this community um, and learning from this community and then trying to do some things to help everybody get educated together. Um, we uh, are working daily to try to prepare the healthcare system um, with providing guidance and conference calls and meetings and consultation and planning and continuous collaboration so that we're all ready and we all know what to do. Um, we are thinking as if we will get a couple of cases, one or two or three, we don't know, of imported uh, Ebola, and we believe we're ready. Um, we have all sorts of public information up on our website, um, and uh, we, we're doing a speakers bureau. People, many of us are traveling the state speaking, coming to community meetings. We have a great health information line. We have expert consultation, Dr. Al, Dr. Alexander Scott, who you'll meet in a few minutes, um, and it is part of that consultative process. So in summer, only people who have been in West Africa in the prior 21 days are at risk. People with no symptoms are not contagious. The outbreak can be stopped by good public health practice. And while we may see a few imported cases in Rhode Island, good public health collaboration will likely prevent any spread. One other item of summary, which is, if we don't do everything we can to get the resources we need to stop this epidemic in Africa tomorrow, um, then we are part of the cause of this epidemic at the end of the day. Thank you.